Are you coming to join me? Yes. Hi everyone. So we're recording this right after we did the second live on Wednesday the 27th. And we have your questions here from Monday and today. And I'm going to go through them with Dad now. Um, anything you'd like to say before we start? No. It's some good questions, but I can't honestly see that we could possibly do them all. There's so many. We're going to see what we can get through. So I should probably do a disclaimer on that note as well and say, <laughs> after every live I say, I'm sorry we can't get to all of your questions. Um, and this was going to be the solution to that, so we'll try and do as many as possible. But this is just some of them. So we'll crack on. Okay. This is a conversation, don't forget. Yes, we've got we've to have fun too, otherwise we won't want to do it. <laughs> so the other thing, sorry, the other issue that I have is sometimes people write things in a way that I wouldn't say them. So I have to read them, <laughs> read them through. Do paintings develop as you work on them, or do you know what the finished article will be when you start? Asked Bill Sandals. Right. Uh, the answer to that is both ways. Um, paintings like um, Centre of the Earth and Journey to the Centre of the Earth, um, Floating Jungle. There's a lot of paintings that I had no real idea how they turn out until I actually started. But there are others like Ralea, like Tales, that were finished to a high degree before I actually set started the actual finished work. Is that partly to do with the medium, considering Relay was mm. watercolour and the others that you mm. mentioned were acrylic? The early work was very precise pencil drawing, particularly, say, something like Asia's Alpha, and it was absolutely finalised in the hundreds of sketches. Before I started the finished drawing, and before I first started the finished painting. But now I can start a painting with a good idea, or even with completely open mind about how it might go. Do you think that one of the reasons that you overprepared so much is an aspect of inexperience? And as you get more experience, do you give yourself more leeway? I think it was, yeah, some. But it was also a reflection of my training. I trained very much as a draftsman rather than a painter. So drawing was kind of hardwired into my physical skills. Um, learning to paint was wonderful, but I had to learn it separately after I left college. I mean, this is, it's, it's interesting because we could kind of talk about this, but... Yeah, it would be, a, it'd be an interesting <laughs> subject for a standalone debate. I yes. think what we're going to have to do is, as we do these, just find the right um, kind of compromise between conversation and getting through people's questions. Yes, yes. I think, I think it's got to... Be, we're answering somebody's question, but we're also talking to a lot of people as well. So mm. I think, yeah, focus on what gets your imagination. Okay. Well, I'm ready to move on. Okay. <laughs> Hi Roger, says Mackenzie, oh god, names, uh, Donegan, uh, I was, w sorry if I've got that wrong, I was wondering what is the most valuable piece of advice you've ever been given for painting? I'm going to pass on that, not because I don't want to answer, but I want to cogitate while you're doing the other ones. Okay. Jasper Joppe? Gears. Roger. Settle for first names. Jasper asks. Because even they won't recognise your attempts. <laughs> um, Roger, how did you do the background blends in your early work? Well, some of them were airbrush. Um, Tails was an airbrush. Um, Relay was an airbrush. But Tails, by the time I did Tails, that was coming close to the end of my ever using an airbrush on the painting, or nearly. I found I loved the texture of doing it with, with a brush much more than the mechanical smoothness. 
Have you ever tried those spray cans? You can get Liquitex acrylic paint. Well, here's the thing. I say airbrush, but back in the early days when I was doing this, I could never afford an airbrush. So I was actually using cans of enamel. They didn't have acrylic paint in cans back then. So I was using cans of enamel. Hmm. I've been using those Liquitex spray cans and it's really fun. Huh. Because you don't have to do all of that stuff of cleaning the airbrush out and then putting everything in white spirit and all the fiddly stuff. Just a thought. David Bagsby asks, how do you feel about the style of Franklin Booth or Bernie Wrightson? Oh, these are two incredibly good um, pen and ink drawing artists. Franklin Booth is from a previous century and Bernie Wrightson is a, was an artist we published in the studio. He was one of the four guys in the studio. And an incredible draftsman, both of them. Bernie did... Um, he d illustrated Frankenstein. Beautiful drawings. Franklin Booth, I don't know what books he illustrated, but I have books of his drawings and they're wonderful. I should do some research before we do these. It happens when we're doing the lives that people ask questions about things and I don't know what they are. Mm, okay, well, on happen. those two, it would, be, would have been easy to get samples of their work, so we should yeah. do that next time. Well, I, yeah, um, I, I know Bernie Wrightson's work a bit, but Franklin Booth, not so much. Okay, so his book is right there on the shelf. Okay, well, this is good for me too. Um, Alessandro Mengoni asked, sorry, I try again. <laughs> Mr. Dean will attend the new European tour with Yes next year, especially Roma, or only the UK tour? Thank you. No, no, I, I'm the plan at the moment, and I have to say that it... It's, we're hoping it will become solid, it looks like it's going to be, is I'll definitely be on the tour for all the European dates, UK dates and American dates. So that is the plan at the moment. Who knows what fate will bring, but that is the plan. Hmm. Are they going to Japan as well? I don't know about that. Hmm. Rubus Pesta. This is where I live, by the way, in case nobody knew. So it'd be nice to see Dad, although we've seen quite a lot of each other recently. <laughs> anyway. Your marriage. <laughs> Aki, oh my gosh. I, I do want to say people's full names, so I'm going to try. Aki Veteranta, Veteranta, asks, mm -hmm. few words on Arnold Bocklin and typography, if you may, Roderick. Arnold Bocklin was... Um an Art Nouveau artist. There is a typeface called Bocklin, and his, probably one of his most famous paintings was the Island or the Isle of Death. I think that's what it was called. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting artist. Worth checking out. Um, Tal Morris wanted to know uh, where you can go to purchase an original Roger Dean painting agent. Yeah, well, if you go to my website, uh, or if you send an inquiry to the website, that will be forwarded immediately to the gallery and they will respond to you. So, go to the website. Yeah, aim any inquiry to the website. Todd Skay asks, are you still going to make the Floating Islands movie? I love the way that question is put. It's never been off the agenda. Um, we've had setbacks. Some of them have been very disappointing because we've seen really close. Um, I'm working with Alistair Wardsley right now. He's a scriptwriter. And he's kind of roughing out the story, part of which appeared in the last tour, the last Yes Tours tour book. So, yes, we're working on it by stealth, if you like, at the moment. Greg Mar Boll asked, 
As an avid fan of the Japanese mini LP CDs known as Kami Paper Sleeve Collection, can you describe your involvement with Disc Union for making special collectors promo boxes, as well as returning to recreate the original texture covers or trifold for Yes songs? I know a lot of people are clueless about mini LPs, so this would be great to, to talk about. I'll anxiously await your comments. Thanks. Well, Japan is very lucky, or Tokyo specifically, to have Disc Union because they really, really care for the quality of their albums. And I think Japan does as well. I think when you're looking at that combination of music and art as a gift, Japan has virtually no competition in that, in terms of the quality of the thing. So Disc Union did come to me and they wanted to do two box sets. Disc Union is a record retailer. And what's interesting and exciting about them is they decide their customers would like this product and they create it and they buy the records off the record company. So they create their own packaging, not the record company, but they ask the record company for the packaging, for the records, sorry. And when they wanted to do this retrospective, two box sets of yes, I did say, I very much wanted Warner Brothers in Japan to do yes songs. It was originally intended like a four page book. We actually took out patents so that could be folded out of one sheet of card. <laughs> but, you know, once it was manufactured in, in America, they don't, I hate to say it, but Atlantic Records had an in house printer who were terrible. They never seemed to give a damn about quality. I've got to show you this TV show um, that we were watching called The Toys That Made Us. Yeah. And it seems like so many toys were just made as merchandise for TV shows. But what America and Japan often did was America would make the TV show and then they'd get Bandai or Namco to make the toys. Yeah. So things like Transformers and Power Rangers and that kind of thing. But they would also get Japan to do the fight scenes for some of the things as well. So in Power Rangers, you have these American teenagers chatting in school hallways, and then it will cut to a load of Japanese guys fighting in the suits because you can tell it wasn't the same people. And I always wondered why the quality of the fight scenes, the film was so much more rubbish than when they're filming in the school, but it was filmed in a completely different country at a different time because they took the fight scenes from the original show but they would get the toys made in Japan because they were just so incredible. And we were watching these, and these were made when I was a child, and it was, you could make a gun into a robot, and yes. the gun would fire things. Yes. Just amazing. I don't know why everyone doesn't just have their manufacturing and packaging and everything done there. Well, I would say, I don't know why everybody doesn't have that demand for excellence that drives a lot of uh, Japanese stuff. Yeah. It's, it is heartwarming. I love it. So do I. That's why I live here. <laughs> One of the many reasons. <laughs> Have you ever worked on a commission you didn't initially like? Asked Piotr Grabowski. Yeah, but it's, if I didn't like it, it's not something I really want to talk about. Okay. Should we carry on? Yes. <laughs> Not that there's anything particularly mysterious, but you know, I love talking about what I like. Mm. Good point. Jacques Philo, 48, asks, do you think about one light source or several? Well, huh. I always think of one primary light source with bounce back and reflected light, um, unless the subject matter includes light sources, like the recent painting where there is multiple light sources. But if I'm talking about a natural scene, I'm looking at one source and reflected light. Because I suppose your paintings generally are set in natural landscapes, so there would only be limited. It's not like in a cityscape yeah. where there'd be lots of light sources. Yeah, a lot are. Jasper, Jasper asks, um, 
So some of you ask lots of very good questions. And we've got Jasper again. Is there any reason why those rocks come in the picture from the right side? Most of your images are done like this. One day when we have all the editing equipment, um, we'll have someone cut in some pictures, won't we? Yes, I'm, I am th wondering if that's true, but it's certainly true today. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm, it's certainly true today, but it's not, it isn't invariably true. I mean, look at the one up on the wall there. Mm, mm. So it's. But that's a mirror of that one. No, it's not. Oh. It's we a part shouldn't of talk it. about things we can't show anyway. Should yes. We? Okay. If I'm working energetically, there is a natural uh, calligraphy or choreography, which is art this way. Um, sometimes I do that, but not often. If I have to do that, I'll turn the painting around. But, but I can paint in any direction, but if it's high speed, it's, it is, there is an arc. And you, I can look at paintings when they've been flit dozens of times and see immediately whether it's how I did it or it's a mirror image of how I did it. But that's partly because you're right-handed now. But you weren't. I wasn't. So the answer is, it may be, I'm going to have to look at that, because it might be that there is a preponderance of emphasis from the right. I'd really like to know, so this is something I've been talking to a lot of people about recently. I went to schools, and then I went to art schools, and what I noticed, one of the things I noticed is, there was a hugely greater percentage of left-handed or dyslexic people in art school than in normal school, and often they were both left-handed and dyslexic. Which is was which was my case. Which was your case, um, and I want to find out kind of more about this because there are certain things that particularly men have that they think have an evolutionary reason for being that way, like colour blindness. You can see movement more easily, and only men get colour blindness. Yeah, right. Hmm. Um, but I was thinking that dyslexia might have something, some advantage as well, which is why I got that book, The Dyslexic Advantage. Hmm. But it seems like a lot of cre creative people have dyslexia and are also left-handed, even though you've changed to being right-handed. Well, there was a long period when I was at college when I could work with both hands, but I have moved to predominantly using my right hand. I'd like to know like, if anyone knows anything more about this, really, because oh, I don't know if I should say this, but I've noticed that people who are dyslexic just seem to think slightly differently as well, the way that they imagine things. And in Japan, they don't have a writing that's... They have a phonetic alphabet, but they don't have words like we do. All our words are built up of letters, and they have little pictures. So it's... I think it's not really a thing in Japan, dyslexia. But I know some people who I think, if you'd grown up learning English, I think you'd be dyslexic, just because the way they think is sort of, I don't know, it's sort of broader, more lateral, more image-oriented. A discussion to have. Yeah, I'd like to know if anyone actually knows anything about that. Um, right. Kettle asks, why is it always pine trees? I don't. Um, obviously today I have, but um, I spent mm, years walking Freya's dog in Ashdown Forest, which was had a large number of pine trees, but I've done I did, the painting I did for example for Steve Hackett a couple of years ago, was oak trees, and um the painting I did with the waterfall for Rick Wakeman, um, Myths and Legends of King Arthur, that was ash trees. And the one I did for Asia's, I'm always going to think of it as Valkyrie, but it was actually called Gravitas. Valkyrie for me was the title it should have been. That was Silver Birch. So. Yeah, pine trees when I'm doing rocky outcrops, maybe. 
because that's where they thrive. Um, but they're not by any means the only trees I paint. Sandy asks, do you like Neil Gaiman's work? I love Neil Gaiman's work, yes. Neil Gaiman interviewed me when he was a student and he wrote about how dusty my studio was. <laughs> oh, well. Anything else? <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> I've got it somewhere. I've got part of his interview somewhere. I must look it up. How old were you both? Well, he was still at school. And it was, oh, bloody hell. I can't remember how long ago. Long time ago. Do you remember the interview? No. Do you remember him saying your studio was dusty? Well, what happened was um, we met at Dave McKean's birthday party. Can you remember? Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him and he said, you won't remember, but I interviewed when I was a kid at school. And I said, good God, you're right, I don't remember. <laughs> but, but you've got it. Yeah, I, I got the interview. Somebody yeah, sent it to me. Much. And um, he, he had a partner who came to exhibition at Trading Boundaries, who was with him. There was two of them. Mm. His partner lives locally. Mm. Yeah, I love his work. And I would even if he hadn't interviewed me. <laughs> Okay. David Eric Selvin asks, in a previous session, you mentioned the difference between two kinds of white. Can you say something about using two different kinds of blacks, like, say, Mars black and ivory black? Well, the two, two different kinds of white are titanium white and zinc white. And I use zinc, for example, if I'm doing a painting with aerial perspective, I can gently, layer at a time, take something back in space with coats of zinc white because it's translucent. So it's like, it's like atmosphere in between you and the subject. And if there's, you're painting another piece on top, it gives it real depth. So some of the most, some of the paintings I've got where I've got a real sense of depth has been a consequence of using zinc white, transparent white. If I've made a mistake and I want to get rid of it, titanium white does the trick. It also turns colours into pastel versions of themselves. Um, Mars black and bone black or even more carbon black. Um, I could paint a board in Mars black and then paint something in t on top of it in carbon black and it would sh it would show up as one as black and one as grey so it's it's almost a hole in the painting carbon black is very very deep black and I did a fair bit of black in the last painting but it is not a normal thing for me the colour I used in the two paintings I did today and Monday um, which looks like black is actually a mix of magenta, blue and yellow, transparent. And they, they're primary colours and they're, when the balance is almost equal, it comes out like a fairly richly coloured black. But if you use pure black, it would not have that richness. There's also that black that that artist patented. What's his name? What's his name? Indian, he did those huge wax structures going through tunnels and God, he did the Olympics as well. What's his name? You can't ask me, I don't know. Oh, it's so frustrating. He copyrighted or patented his own black, which apparently absorbs 99.9% .9 of light. So when you paint it on something, it just looks like there's a hole there. Right. And another artist got very upset about it because they thought no one should have the right to patent a colour and have <laughs> to ask permission to use it. So he came up with his own pigments and 
said anyone could buy them except this artist. <laughs> I can't remember who it was. It's so frustrating. Anyway. Sad argument. Anyway. Um, Anders asks, is there any story behind the Cygnosis logo? Not really. It was a kind of a cliche to use an owl as a symbol of wisdom. I love doing the owl, by the way. I Carry on, I'm going to find this person's name. <laughs> I am listening. Well, no, I've answered the question. Oh, okay. That was about <laughs> it. Go for the next one. Um, okay. What do you think of garden trains? Oh, garden trains? I, I think you'd like to have one. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. I love trains. Um, my grandfather had a gigantic garden set, which I only rarely ever saw running. Mostly I saw it running indoors. But he, he had maybe 30 or 40 engines, and they were O-gauge, so they're quite big. And when he died, he gave them to me, and I've mentioned this story. Adnish Kapoor. Right. So, yeah. What can I say? I, I love model trains. Whether in the garden or in a box or... Yeah, anywhere. Yes. So, I'm slightly aware of the time. We've still got tons of questions. I'm sorry. Actually, okay, let me see. No, we've got three more pages. Um, so, let's try and get some good ones before we wrap up. Um, I think this is quite an important one. Um, what do you use for reference when you paint animals? And they've put in brackets, they're always very realistic, which is nice. Hmm. Well, huh, the owls um, were both owls and animal. Well, one was in Carla Lane. The owl that was in the painting, the old bridge, was from Carla Lane's Animal Sanctuary. And I went down there and sketched it and took photographs. And the one that was used in Blind Owl Landing was um, a neighbour had it. These were both European eagle owls, and both, in both cases, sadly, it's illegal to release them, which seems kind of crazy. But there you go. It's. Yeah, that was, yeah, again, sketches and photographs, many sketches, many, many photographs. The one that I actually used in the painting, Blind Owl Landing, was a photograph taken by Amon, not by me. But that is how I would do it. Um, I took a lot of photographs at the zoo near Lyme Lynn. What was the name of that zoo? Yeah. I can't remember. I but it did have elephants and it did have big cats lazing around. So, and I took a lot of photographs, by the way, in Kenya. I went to Kenya with your mother in the middle of the time we were doing publishing. The real challenge, though, is to get good reference, either drawings or photographs of dragons. That's always a challenge. Yes. Good point. I just thought, yeah, that question. Sorry, I didn't read out the name. That question was from Don Rogers, which is almost your name in reverse. Get on with it. Um, Danny asks, Tales and Relaya, the rocks fit together from one cover to the other. Where did that idea come from? Was it a band member? I'm sorry that um, I shouldn't really let you ask that because I have promised I would never answer that question. Oh, okay. Many well, times. you should have put that in the notes I could have. that yes, we I went did. through before. <laughs> okay. um, can you talk about uh, Doug Curran asks? Can you talk about rare earth inside painting for one world? What or where is the setting, and what is Roger's name for it? Well, that is an annoying story. I was asked to do the cover 
for the band Rare Earth and I did and they asked me to send the original this was way back at the very beginning of my career and very naively I sent them the original they not only didn't use it on the cover but they didn't return it I don't really blame the band I think it was a, a management issue um, I haven't ever given that painting a title one of the things about it that I was really thrilled about how it turned out was the sky it had a lovely marbled sunset look hmm maybe I should think more about that and see if I can resurrect it because we did fortunately have a transparency um Has Roger ever tried to communicate environmental or conservation messages in his work? Not in that sense, no. Because what I'm trying to do in a lot of the work, particularly obviously the architecture, but in the paintings too, is to excite people about what could be and say, we could, we could make the world like this. We don't have to put up with the incredible crass concreting over that we have, you know, the evidence of humans on this planet is concreted over the, not, the natural world. And I really don't like that. Um, so it's kind of um, a nudge to say, we could do things much better we could design buildings, we could design cities, we could design cities that were like a paradise. It would not be a big deal, but it would mean a different way of thinking. So I want to say, yes, it's a, it's a, a plea for a different way of thinking, but particularly the architecture. The architecture has very real, very ver verifiable um, environmental credentials very good ones that are hard to match in a conventional building they wouldn't be I don't think possible to match in a conventional building so without it being an environmental story it has fabulous environmental credentials cows are going off again can you hear them yes the cattle Speaking in the background <laughs> have been com <laughs> complaining about something for days now they were so loud yesterday, I was really worried someone was harassing them, so I made Dad walk down to the field with me and, and pick up some rocks and see if we needed to scare off any teenagers. <laughs> but it just seems like in the evening they get very noisy. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose indirectly, like during the lockdown, loads of animals have been coming into towns and things, haven't they? And if we lived in cities or villages that didn't look so conspicuously out of sync with nature, maybe animals would feel more a part of things too. Mm. That would be nice. Well, birds can come and go. It would be nice to see more of them. But to get birds to come and go, we're going to have to get insects to come and go. There's all kinds of things. It's, it's a very, very complicated, but very, very soluble and important to solve problem. Mm. Sorry, I just I just thought Mum's got something called an insect B and B, but I thought a better name for it would be a B B and B. Anyway, get on with the questions. Killian Marillion asks, can you give us any more information about the upcoming Yes projects you mentioned in the last video? Do you know when we could expect to see them released? Okay, this, the very simple answer to that is no. One of them is very secret and I don't know much about it myself and the other is to do with Close to the Edge and apparently they're not in distress. Yes, the Close to the Edge project, I think um, I'll ask Martin Darwin if we can talk a little bit about it. Colin Sefton asks... Um, 
In a very early session, you showed us a sketchbook of tracing paper pages. Where do you get such a sketchbook? I've never seen one. I have only seen books of semi-transparent layout pages. I haven't made. I find um, paper I really like working on, which is typo detail paper, which is in fact semi-transparent. I have had some made with high quality tracing paper, but it's not so amenable to, for pencil drawing. It's good for pen and ink, and strangely enough, it's good for crayon, because it has a real bite. So it takes off a crayon a great deal of color, and you get great color saturation. Um, so it's horses for courses. So my challenge was to find the paper I wanted and then have the books made. So someone might have to go to a binder, a book binder. Yeah. Hmm. What I would recommend, though, is that um, I've done an enormous amount of drawing on loose paper, but it is loose. <laughs> and the beauty of the sketchbooks is there in one place, and you can find stuff easier. Hmm. I always have that difficult thing though, sketchbooks look so much better when they're really dense, but when they're really dense you can't take something out and frame it, you have to choose, yeah. unless you do one other, every other page. Oh I have, yes, I have lots of sketchbooks, big ones, where I've got very detailed drawings in, but for, well, unless I make prints, they'll never be framed. Ready for the next one? Yeah. Um, Malcolm asks, uh, you're credited on Mike Oldfield's Earth Moving. What was your input? I was credited on what? Mike Oldfield's Earth Moving. Was that? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I will investigate. We'll it's not usually that way round, though, is it? <laughs> that you're credited without realising. By the way, <laughs> I was given this cup of tea. I was surprised to get a cup of tea with... Bob Ross, mm -hmm. his picture on it. But this is Frere's constantly teasing me. <laughs> no, I wasn't. It usually has his painting, but he's let the tea go cold, so oh, the okay. painting disappears. Okay. There are so many good questions, and we really should... Go on. Uh, um, okay, we'll just do like one or two more, but we'll try and get through. Um... Any particular film directors you like? Terry Gilliam, David Lynch, Michelle Gondry? Yeah. Okay, next question. Oh, wait, <laughs> Kurosawa. You can't, you can't not have Kurosawa. So, those four? No. <laughs> no, Miyazaki. Um, Sorry, that was Mark's question. Right. Kurosawa, Miyazaki, definitely. Um, Michael Mann? I might make a list. Mm, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, two lists, one one of animators, one of... One of the books you listen to while you're painting. Yeah, okay, we make all these lists. Yeah. Um, okay, I like this question. Anders asks, any plans to make a movie or TV series of the Dragon Rider from your book Views? Not really, no. Um, we have about five or six stories that um, we own. And I think any one of them could explore in that direction. Well, not true, some of them could explore in that direction. But, um, hmm, we'll have to see. I've had talks with um, Alistair about doing books of the film ideas. Mm. We'll see. I can't find it now. Somebody asked a question about a story you told me when I was young about a dragon. And now I can't... I must have missed that. But I, the story Dad told me when I was little, pretty much every night was about a girl called Ping who fought demons in Tibet. Was it in Tibet? Right, it was a mythical place. A mythical place, but definitely sort of Himalayan. <laughs> I 
think. <laughs> and she had a pony called Pong. <laughs> and I think we should do that story. Because that, Dad, you started recording it, didn't you? And that must be hundreds of hours of that story that you've got. I did start recording it. Yes. So on old fashioned cassettes. We should do something about that. Um, now, there's one more question, but I think it will take you hours to answer it, so we might save it for the next que uh, for the next Q and A session that we do. I'll tell you what it is, though. Go on. So you can think about it. Um, this is Ivra, and they said cheeky question, but what is your opinion on socialist architecture, which, funny enough, or funnily enough, has the similar idea of designing a new future behind it? You can think about that one. Because I think you're good. <laughs> well, I think, what can I say? It was my bugbear throughout college. The ideas of people like Le Corbusier and the other Bauhaus members were so stunningly sterile. Their vision of the future and the architecture they produced was deathly. So the I don't think it was. Agree. Sorry. The cows agree. The cows agree. Yes, yes, yes. I, <laughs> I don't think it was anything to do with socialism. I think it was to do with the sterility of their way of thinking. I think you could have socialist architecture that is brilliant. So I think the fact that they were all Kabusier was a communist. I think the fact that they were all socialists or communists is irrelevant. Their architecture was sterile. My objection to it, really, is that it looks like you need a state to provide for you. If you look at things like medieval villages, where there's a little village green and it's around, it's in, you know, surrounded by forest and maybe there's gardens, there's sort of little pockets where you can see, you could eat and you could drink and you could socialise. Whereas with socialist or communist architecture, it's in huge buildings, miles away from any nature, where they well, need to be put Yeah, I, I don't think we should call it socialist architecture because it's been taken on board wholesale by the capitalist systems. Mm. It's still sterile and dull and unbelievably boring. And you still have someone you're beholden to, to survive, either way. Yeah, yeah. So I don't like the architecture. The, everything that came from the Bauhaus... I mean, they wanted things to look like they were designed by machines for machines. The four machines I added. And no, it's dehumanizing, it's crippling to the soul. I won't answer it this time. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. <laughs> well, we've been going on for ages. Um, I feel like we should like leave on a little upbeat note. I grew these. <laughs> Aren't they nice? <laughs> <laughs> you planted them. I planted them and then let them do their thing, which is sometimes all you need to do. Indeed. So there you go. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, so this will be going up on Friday. Um, join us on Monday. Yes. For the live and Wednesday for the live and. Yes. I never, I never get through all the questions. I think we did a good chunk there. I don't think we could spend any more time on this. We've been here for ages, and I've got to go to bed. <laughs> we'll have a, we'll be more disciplined. But thank you, thank you for asking. Mm, thank you. They're really good questions. Yes. Keep going, keep going, and if I miss them, they're more likely to come up if you just keep putting them in there. I'm gonna okay. read through. Thank you. Who switches off? You've I got, got a, I got a little I got a little remote. <laughs> <laughs>